Anna Hyatt Huntington was one of the most prolific sculptors um, of the 20th century, and her uh, career spans um, a little over 80 years. So that's a lot of sculptures, and nobody really knows how many sh how many pieces she created or how many pieces were um, duplicated from her work. But estimates are about 500, and the closest total I could find to a number of the number of subjects was about 267. So um, Anna was a woman of independence. She was, uh, she had a deep creative instinct, but she was considered a lady that no one had much bad to say about her. And she was, she is said to be very friendly, comfortable, be around, she would make you feel at home. And she was a lady in every sense of the word. So um, right there, a nice Southern woman for us to, to emulate. We are uniquely tied to the mayor, to Anna Hyatt Huntington, of course, because she and Archer were our founders. And it's also very fitting that we are in the Huntington Room, named after them, and we are actually in the presence of some of Anna's sculpture from our collection. Anna was born um, March 10th, um, 1876, to um, Adela Beebe Hyatt and um, Alpheus Hyatt Jr. in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and she couldn't have picked a better family. Uh, she joined her sister Harriet, who was eight, and her brother Alpheus III, who was five at the time. And um, Alpheus, the father, had been educated at Yale, uh, taught at uh, Boston University and Massachusetts Institute of, Tech, Institute of Technology, and he was a distinguished and very well-known professor of paleontology and zoology. Um, Adela was, uh, and both of her, uh, the, Anna's the grandmothers, and I'll get going in a minute, I apologize, were all trained artists. Adela was a very talented landscape watercolorist, and to help her husband, she would often illustrate his lecture slides, uh, his books, and his pamphlets. So Anna was introduced to art from a very early age. Um, Anna would say, I feel from the time, I, I had a feeling for animals from the time I could crawl around, and I love them too much to be afraid of them, which is really good, because Anna was, from the time she could crawl, was drawn to animals. Uh, she would disappear, and they'd have to hunt her down. She'd slip away from her nanny or her mother, and they would find her in the stall of the family horse, often laying on the straw, watching the horse's mouth and the muscles in its face as it ate. Um, her sister Harriet recalls that they almost had a heart attack one time when Anna was about four or five and she was missing. They found her laying in the road amongst the horses passing by, um, fixated on their feet and the motions of their legs. From an early age, Anna was encouraged by her mother to observe and draw, and she did very detailed drawings, uh, even as a child, of animals and their musculature. She um, was encouraged by her father in different ways. Because her father would go to zoos and animal shows to study the animals, he took Anna along. He imparted upon her a keen knowledge of animal behavior, a strong understanding of animal physiology and how the um, musculature and the, the bones of an animal affect its movement. He also found a kindred spirit in all of his children. Um, Alpheus's uh, love from an early childhood was zoology, and he imparted not only his love of zoology, but his love of learning, and his, it was a very intellectually stimulating household for Anna. Um, and the father and the mother and the grandparents all encouraged and nurtured the children's interests. Um, the, um, you know, there we go. The family was fairly affluent. I'm going to step back one. I, there we go. The family was fairly affluent, and uh, this allowed them to uh, privately educate the children. One of the issues that was going on in Cambridge, especially for Harriet, who had determined at an early age to be an artist, was there were no art schools. And at the time, um, education for women, particularly art education, was very limited unless you had a tutor. So Alpheus arranged for tutors for both Anna and Harriet. Alpheus is going to become a farmer and later follow his father's footsteps into zoology. 
But going back to Anna, um, Anna did not want to be an artist. Um, by the age of 14, she had determined that that wasn't her path. She wanted to be a concert violinist. And Anna was imbued with the, the sense that she had to be the best at whatever she did. Uh, she had to strive for, protection, for, for perfection, and she worked very, very hard. So about eight hours a day, every day, Anna was at her violin. She was either being tutored or practiced. And eventually that uh, kind of wore on her. By the time she was 19, she had what was then described as a nervous prostation, which we might call a nervous breakdown. It took her a while to, uh, to get away from that, to, to recover from it. Um, she was exhausted. She had no will to do anything. So basically she was dep severely depressed. And one day Harriet, who had been working on a statue, um, may have given her the lifeline. And it, Harriet told Anna, she said, I'm having trouble with the leg on this animal. You've known animals since you were knee high to a grasshopper. Can you help me? And it's very possible that uh, because Harriet was a very accomplished sculptor and artist and, and painter, she really didn't need the help. She was giving her sister the lifeline to bring her out of her funk. And Anna's hands on the clay ignited something in her. It was a passion that music didn't seem to fulfill. And she said she learned that this was more of her line than music. Harriet encouraged her, gave her tips, and Anna started working with the clay. Um, she and Harriet uh, worked on a collaboration. Uh, one of the student, one of their tutors, um, his name was Nitzen, um, encouraged them to enter a show, a local show in Boston, and they did a sculpture of a uh, young boy standing next to their family Great Dane. The Great Dane standing on his hind legs, his front feet are on um, the young boy's shoulders, and the boy is fastening a collar around his neck. Uh, it was very, very well received in the in the show and Anna got her start. She started by um, sculpting animals or making clay forms of the animals around them, the goats and the sheep from the neighbors, um, the farm animals in, in the area, horses, of course, and um, the animals she saw at the zoo and at the, at the, um, the shows, the animal shows that her father took her to. This, she really got her start there. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna click. You can see how well prepared I am, I apologize. Um, Anna was also tutored by the same um, artist, the same artist that Harriet was seeing, was uh, studying under, but Anna didn't have great luck because Anna had a tendency to tell it like it was. She walked into Henry Kitson's um, studio and almost immediately critiqued his uh, his technique on a horse and was promptly shown the door. Um, she would later say that she really didn't see him ever again after that, nor his wife, even though they ran in the same social circles at times. And um, Gustav Borglum was another of their, their tutors. You may recognize the name or not, but um, he was the designer of Mount Rushmore. She didn't like his horses at all either, but really didn't tell him that. She'd learned her lesson. Um, but she decided at that point that the, the art instruction she was receiving was not a correct. Um, she was um, accused of being a, a spoiled rich girl by her tutor. Um, but she would say later she, she deserved that criticism, but she was trying not to be stuck up or, um, or be um, mean in any way. She just saw it like it was. This is a young girl that had been studying horses all her life. She kept scrapbooks of horses. And one of the family games, especially when visitors and friends were over, was to have her pull out her scrapbook. They would cover a picture and just by the tip of an ear or the color of the, the, um, the hair on the horse's picture, she could tell you who they were, what their name was, what their, their um, pedigree was. So she truly knew her horses. While she was um, while she was working with Harriet, um, her father gave them something that um, was a boost, and it gave her her first push into a professional career. They the summer house, the family summer's house on the Anasquam River in Gloucester, Massachusetts, had enough land that 
um, Alpheus not only started a marine ecology lab there, he did informal summer sessions for his students from the universities and the colleges. And so Anna got uh, exposed to that, but Alpheus also built his daughters a studio. And it's from that studio that she is going to now have a professional career. Anna um, was doing her sculptures out of clay and plaster, and she got the idea and the, the, had the smart idea to get with a jewelry company called Shreve Crump and Lowe out of Boston that had a foundry. And she could take her plaster and clay pieces to Shreve Crump and Lowe. They would cast them in bronze and put them in their showroom. And they also had exhibitions in their showrooms and they had catalogs listing the pieces. So her first sales came through this jewelry company. She was making a decent living out of it. Um, she was on commission only, so it really depended on whether they could sell. But for a new artist, she didn't have to go out and go door to door or try to find uh, a patron or a sponsor or try to sell them herself. So it was a good benefit for her. Um, one of the, the best sellers, I guess, maybe you could call him a patron, she never met the man, but Thomas Lawson was a very wealthy businessman in Boston and an art collector, and he took a liking to Anna's pieces and pretty much bought everything, or at least a copy of everything that was produced, and he did send her some commissions. Um, it's, I don't know why they never met, I don't know if it was a, her choice or his, uh, but that was a really good introduction to society. Uh, because he was wealthy, he ran in different social circles, uh, word got out about her sculptures, and um, as, as her reputation started growing, she started making more and more money. Um, 1902 was a pivotal time of change for Anna. Unfortunately, um, the family had some, some downturns. Harriet got married in 1900, and as was expected of female artists you know, at the time, um, her career be was expected to be more of a hobby, and she was supposed to turn her attentions to her husband, which she did. Um, so Anna was pretty much left alone in the studio, except for um, Harriet working in it occasionally. And um, she decided that um, it, was, it was almost time to move on to another, to another spot. At that time, artists were expected to go to Europe and study the great masters and work in studios with people who were doing the same techniques as the great masters. Um, but Anna didn't want to do that. She wanted to develop her own style before being trained by somebody else. And that may be one of the reasons she decided not to stay very long with the tutors that she and Harriet had been given. Um, unfortunately for Anna and the family in 1902, her father, their father died of a very sudden, unexpected heart attack. Anna had earned enough money that it was possible to move on. She had decided that New York was where she needed to be. And her mother, Adela, decided to go with them, at least in the, her in the beginning. So she and Adela go to New York. They rent a room in a boarding house in the Bronx. Um, Adela sets up the apartment or the room and gets Anna kind of settled. And Anna starts doing what she knows the best. She starts looking for a job in the city, but she says she found it a rough and soul-searing experience. Now, there are a lot of artists in the city. There are a lot of people looking for jobs. Um, didn't work very well, but she did what she knew. She got with a jeweler, Gorham and Company, in the city who had their own foundry, and they had their own showrooms, and they did exhibitions, and she started with them at a, um, at a commission. And the smallest statue that you see, um, the little bear and cub on the left, um, is about three, oops, and I can't aim, it's about three and a half inches long. The lion and cub at the upper right is about five and a quarter. And the, the, benefit, to, um, the benefit to working with Gorham and company is that because she was working in plaster and clay, her pieces were... Uh, her designs could be modified very, fairly quickly. So a jaguar eating its prey, tearing at its prey with a small modification, could become a jaguar on a letter opener and his prey becomes an envelope. A pair of uh, mountain goats that are fighting that were joined at the, at the head uh, with a few modifications become bookends and now they're fighting each other through books. 
The yawning tiger at the bottom is actually in one of our collections, and it's the room here. Um, so small works were, were a good thing. Um, for a woman artist, animals are a nice subject. They weren't threatening to the male artist, and she moved to New York at the right time. Museums were looking for pieces to add to their collections of American art, particularly the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And um, there was a large group of female artists who provided a good support system to her. There was also, um, there were markets for artists to make medallions and plaques. So there was work to be found. And by going through Shreve, Crump and Lowe, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, and, and Gorham, uh, she didn't have to market herself. She found an easy market and all she had to do was create. Um, uh, Gorham also would make multiple copies, um, so she didn't have to continually remake and remake sculptures. The uh, Jaguar at the bottom that's in our collection is number 134 out of a, a total of 376. And when Gorham, Gorham could keep her uh, plaster casts and her, her um, a clay casts and make them many, many years later, so there was, uh, there was a large market for the pieces. One of the places that she went was the Bronx Zoo. Founded in 1899, at that time when Anna was in New York, they had about 843 animals, 22 different varieties. And the Bronx Zoo was trying to encourage not only artists to um, interpret their, their collections because that was good publicity, but they also wanted to introduce zoology to New Yorkers and to visitors, particularly those who might not have seen or even knew some of these particular animals existed. So in 1903, when the Bronx Zoo built their new lion house, they included an artist studio. Uh, about 21 feet by 36 feet, good size. They consulted with five artists prior to the construction and got ideas of what they needed. It included a locker room. So um, if you were working on a piece and you didn't get it completed, you could leave it. Um, it was good for inclement weather. And it was also good because at the time, if you were an artist and you were working in, in the open air, you would get people around you. They would be commenting. They would, especially in the zoo, you get bumped by families. And so it was very uncomfortable to actually finish anything or work on anything seriously. The problem is, well, somewhat of a problem. The lighting in the, the, in the studio wasn't the best. Now you can see the lion in the cage at the bottom right. There was a rail system where the zoo could actually move animals, live animals into the room for live animal studies. And you see an artist at the left using a um, sculpting table and he's sculpting a baboon from life. Anna did do occasional sketches, but she preferred to do what she called a sketch in clay um, as she watched the animals. She preferred a live animal study. The problem with the studio with the lighting, although it was great for inclement weather, meant that a lot of artists didn't really use it often. And, but they found a secret. They would take a, one of the buildings that had the most noxious odors because they knew that the visitors weren't gonna stay long in there. And they would set up and they would work very easily. One of the other places that Anna liked to visit was Bostick's Great Animal Show. And this was on Coney Island. Bostick's uh, was basically a traveling carnival, uh, started out in England, and it came to the United States, uh, I believe in 1893, um, starting with traveling circus, they ended up getting a building at Coney Island, and there were live animal shows, uh, these are wild animals, there was a lot of interesting um, issues that happened from time to time, um, but Anna was so well known between the animal show and the zoo that she got some privileges. It was not a problem for them to let her get close to the, the bars or the, the barricades. Um, between shows at Bostick, she could go into the areas where the animals are kept. And Anna being Anna was focused more on her art and didn't always pay attention to what was going on around her. She had been spit on by camels. She had been covered with water from elephants that had filled their trunk up and blown it at her. She got hooked in the dress by a bison that was trying to charge her, but could only get its horn through the, the gate, through the, through the fence, excuse me. Um, she had a couple other things. A particular um, 
a particular um, Bengal tiger named Raja was really known for its bad, bad behavior and, and attitude. And there was a guard present while Anna was working, but the guard decided to wander off because Raja seemed to be sleeping. As soon as the guard wanders off, Raja springs up and smacks at Anna. The only thing that kept her from getting shredded by his claws was some sort of sense that she needed to move quickly. Um, she managed to move to the side, but Raja's paw slammed down on her sculpting table and her um, rendition of him completely smashing it. But Anna would always say, I don't fear them because I love them. So it didn't really bother that much. Um, her most um, serious possibility of, of danger or of being harmed was uh, an elephant named Baby, who had supposedly killed four keepers. Um, she would later be um, euthanized by the zoo just because she had killed someone else. Anna was working on a rendition of Baby and um, not realizing that on Sundays, the, um, the zoo would allow them a little more leeway in terms of a leg chain because they would keep, at that time, it was thought that um, elephants had to be chained up by their legs. Um, and she didn't realize that, um, that Baby had more uh, room to move. Baby charged at her and slammed her in the side of the head with, um, with her trunk, sending Anna flying about 10 feet. Um, she was okay, but uh, shaken up a bit. But she didn't learn because not long after that, she went to New Jersey to look at bulls in a farmer's field. She's out there watching the beautiful muscles, the beautiful movement, and the anatomy of the bulls, not realizing that one's getting ready to charge her. The farmer realizes what's going on, grabs a pitchfork, gets between her and the bull. The only thing that saved her there was that the bull decided to throw uh, a bale of hay to show it was upset. But the farmer's sitting there reading, going, uh, sitting there screaming at Anna, uh, can't you run, girl? Can't you run? Get yourself over that fence. Um, that was Anna. <laughs> She's, one day when she was working in the zoo, um, a reporter from the New York Times came in and he was fascinated by her technique. He was used to seeing artists sketch their, um, he had never seen a sculptor actually work on a sculpture from life. And so they wrote up an article on her. Um, this is a picture from the article showing her petting one of the uh, bison. The article uh, was very complimentary. It talked all about her, gave a little bit about her family history, talked about her skills, her techniques, gave a beautiful description of this young woman with a uh, purple hat with a red plume, um, very well dressed, um, very talented. And the New York Times article ended up going national, giving her even more recognition for her work and um, also the zoo too. While she was in New York, uh, obviously it's very expensive. Mom has to go back home um, not too long later after arriving and getting Anna settled. So Anna enters, um, works in a rents an apartment with four with three other women um like anna one uh, two of them were musicians and the third one abastinia saint ledger eberly was a cello artist who gave up the cello for sculpture they uh roomed together from about 1903 to 1906 and they completed two at least two sculptures together the one at the top um boy and goat playing the one at the bottom man and bull uh, the one you see them working on, Anna's on the left working on the goat, and as um, Steeny, as she was known, is working on the boy's leg, and they are using a live model. That was, that was the standard back then. Um, Men and Bull was actually entered into the St. Louis Exposition, uh, the St. Louis Purchase Exposition, which is also known as the World's Fair of 1904, and they won a bronze medal. They were also asked if they would allow their sculpture to travel with other pieces and um, other um, curiosities from the World Fair, and they did. And as it traveled around the United States, words growing, she's still getting more recognition. Anna and Steeny did at least two of these um, figures. They were very close. They stayed together, um, as I said, until 1906, but at some point they parted that year. Anna never speaks and never spoke bad about Steeny, so it's not really sure if they had a falling out. It's more likely that their artistic styles were too different. 
Steeny was part of what they call the Ashcan movement in New York that um, depicted the the dirt, the grime, the homeless, the the downtrodden. And Anna's still more interested in horses, although she would uh, portray some of the horses, uh, the work horses, at not their best moments. Um, but it seems like that 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 was probably the reason that they split. This, this um, and I'm going to shift the page. Um, her first large commissions are actually, we have copies in the back of the room, are the Jaguar and the Reaching Jaguar. These were uh, commissioned by a gentleman in Carolina, um, South Carolina, I believe, for gatepost decorations. The subject was Senor Lopez, a uh, Jaguar at the Bronx Zoo, or then called the New York Zoological Society. Um, Senor Lopez was another one of those bad boys. In fact, he was so scary that the trainers would not get near him. And when they tried to introduce a female, uh, a mate uh, for him, he killed her within minutes. Very, very vicious. Um, and Anna was very much warned, watch him. The problem with Senior Lopez was he pretty much didn't do much, but about two or three times a day, maybe, he would climb to the top of a ledge and look around, stay up for a couple moments, and then climb back down. So for about two weeks, Anna basically lived at the zoo, um, catching any moment she could to maybe get a glimpse of a muscle movement or uh, of the form of his body and worked as quickly as she could to complete uh, her models for him. They were together for two solid weeks, and at the end of the two weeks, um, Senior Lopez would come over to the fence and let Anna scratch his head, um, obviously knowing a kindred spirit. That was her first um, major commission, but she also had another one that she took on um, because she liked the idea of it. Anna had pretty much made up her mind at that point before uh, by the time she was doing the Jaguars, that she was ready to go to, to France, to go to Europe. And she was uh, artistically ready, artistically independent, and financially in the position where she could afford it. But she was requested to do a commission for a high school in Dayton, Ohio, uh, to, to uh, do a lion uh, Leo for the front of their building. She wasn't really prepared to take another commission, but she found out that the school kids had each saved nickels. They had collected nickels and had raised about $300 towards the cost of the statue, and that touched her heart. She found that very endearing. So she agreed to do the commission without any, any payment to herself. The benefit for taking the commission to her was it was cheaper to cast bronze in Europe, where they were doing a lot of the, uh, the early techniques. They were not, they were putting the molds in the ground. They were pouring the bronze in. They were praying over each step. They were celebrating each step. And while it took longer, it was much cheaper than it was to cast the bronze in the United States. It still would cost about $1,500. So Anna went to Europe. She worked on um, the, the uh, she worked on her, her um, models uh, based on Sultan, who was a black, um, a black African lion. And yes, Sultan, uh, the statue is wearing glasses in the, the bottom right. Um, some of the students made glasses out of wire and hung them over, and I just thought that was kind of cool. Um, he looks very 60-ish. Um, she did return to um, Dayton in 1908 for the unveiling, and the reason she was chosen for the commission was one of the members of the committee uh, happened to see a lion statue uh, that she had done, a lion sculpture, and um, recommended her. Um, she worked on this sculpture um, through the winter of 1907, 1906 into 1907, um, and then um, it was cast between May, uh, April and May of 1907, and then it was installed in 1908. Anna was doing a lot of cats, but she hated cats. <laughs> um, she would tell you to your face that cats can't be trusted, particularly after she had been slapped at it a couple times. She much preferred dogs, but when Anna was starting out as, uh, with her art, there was a French artist who was making his name doing cats, particularly house cats, domesticated cats, and letters in the, Syrac in the Syracuse um, collection from Anna's documents and papers 
uh, show that her family and all of her acquaintances were really encouraging her to do cats. If you want to be an artist, you've got to do cats. So she, I, she might have cussed every moment she did that, but she was a lady, so maybe not. Anna gets into France. Um, she had gone early 1906 to scout out a, a studio. She goes back in early 1907 um, to work seriously and to work on the project that was nearest and dearest to her heart. Anna had a kindred spirit in Joan of Arc. She had read a biography that um, uh, Mark Train had written uh, talking about um, Joan's life and her cause. And she felt like uh, Joan was an independent woman like herself. Uh, Joan knew who she was, knew who she was spiritually and knew who she was uh, physically. Um, so Anna decided while she was in France to visit all the places that were related to Joan, where she was burned at the stake, where she went into battle, where she lived, where she was born. And that was an interesting subject for Anna because every French artist that probably ever lived had portrayed Joan of Arc at one point in their career. That was sort of the thing you did. Um, the only problem is most of those depictions did not show Joan as an independent woman. They showed her as the visionary or the young girl. So Anna decided she needed to do something different. She got about uh, a ton of clay and she started working on Joan. The artists in France and around the world at that point, the goal was to be shown at the Paris Salon, a, a yearly happening uh, given at the Louvre that originally started out as a show for artists that were being supported by royal, the French royalty, uh, the French royal family, and later opened to artists of any nationality and gender. But she also knew that at the time, it was assumed that women could not do large sculptures because of the actual work. The armature, the metal armature to hold up the support, the clay and the plaster and the bronze work that needed to be done. So she closed off her studio to anybody who was a male, no delivery people, no anybody. She hired a female assistant to do some work, but she did the work on the sculpture herself. And she created a life-size rendition in clay of Joan of Arc. Um, as she was going into battle, holding her, holding her sword up to be consecrated by the Lord. She entered it into the 1910 Paris Salon where she got an honorable mention. It would rave reviews. Nobody had ever seen Joan depicted this way. Um, nobody really believed a woman had done it. And there, the judges were skeptical, but they wanted to award her something. They still didn't totally believe she'd done the work herself. But there was also probably some bias because she was an American artist and not a French artist who had created it. The public loved it and postcards were made and sold all through Europe and it was a hit. The picture you see on the left is also in our collection. Uh, Marion Boyd Allen um, portrayed Anna in 1915 working on a small model of Joan of Arc and that's going to be a little bit different Joan of Arc. If you will notice the Joan in this particular sculpture, her legs are bent, um, her body's bent forward. Um, Unbeknownst to Anna and a lot of other people at the time, in 1909, um, New York decided that they needed a sculpture of Anna, I mean, excuse me, of Joan of Arc, to celebrate her 500th anniversary, but also to um, kind of get some um, goodwill with, with uh, Paris, with France. And so they were searching for an artist to portray Joan of Arc for a statue that they wanted to put in Central Park. And a gentleman who worked with um, Tiffany and Company um, just was happened to be in Europe and saw the sculpture. Um, incidentally, the face for even though artists would typically use nude models and then portray them with the, the armor on when they finished the sculpture, um, we don't know who exactly the artist the the model was, but she was said to be Mademoiselle Laurent. So just in case you're on Jeopardy. Um, Anna did audition horses for her um, statue. She literally had 
stables, bring these Percheron huge horses back, have them parade back and forth in front of her while she watched them. She took some pictures and she studied them and she ended up picking one and it was in her studio with her. Uh, the problem is Anna had a tendency to feed them treats. So she always said that the horse going into the studio never looked like the horse that went back out. But she couldn't hold herself back from, from treating it that way. So Anna is a chosen, Anna, um, Jay Sanford Salt is the Tiffany exec, goes back to New York and suggests that the committee uh, interviews Anna and they pick her to do the statue. Um, this is what her New York statue looks like. This, because she wanted to make sure that there was no question that a woman could do a public statue, she chose to do it one and a quarter life size. And um, it took about three tons of clay, but she also made seven different, seven different versions. And that was one of the versions that you saw uh, in the, the portrait that was done. She did seven different sizes. Each time she, in, she enlarged the size, she added more details. And she also got with the curator at the Metropolitan Museum, who was supposed to be an expert in armor, to find out what correct armor uh, Joan would be wearing. Um, he would take credit for it, and he'd be given credit later, but it turns out it was probably one of his interns that did the work and was, was way closer than he was in terms of correctness. Leading up to the, um, the installation of the statue, there were some celebrations. Anna was asked to dress as Joan of Arc and parade around on a white horse with armor. She did, but she said she didn't understand how anybody could actually move or, or breathe with that armor because it was so heavy. Um, so she was getting a lot of recognition for this statue. It was um, unveiled in 1915, and um, the preliminary models that she had done were later sold to collectors and um, people that were interested. There are still some out there for sale. You, they pop up occasionally. The face on this Joan was actually her niece, um, but I do not know if she had her pose nude. I don't think so. One of the things that came after this was um, another recognition for Anna as Joan of Arc. In New York each year, there was a Beaux Arts Festival. It was basically a costume ball for the architects of the city and their followers. And it was to celebrate the most innovative architectural design, Beaux Arts design in, in the, the city. And Anna was asked to attend as Joan of Arc, which she did, um, culminating the evening. Um, the, the evening culminated in Anna riding in on a white horse in full Joan of Arc costume and armor stopping in front of an unfurled American flag, everybody sang the, um, the uh, Star Spangled Banner, and that made newspapers, of course, too. A lot of people were involved in the, the construction, the financing of this particular statue, and one of them was Archer Huntington. Uh, the the um, adopted son of Collis P. Huntington, the founder of the Newport News Shipbuilding and Dry Dock Company down the road, um, also, he was our later a co-founder here. Um, Archer um, was sort of a private person. He was a poet, an author, uh, a, an intellectual, a scholar. And like Anna, he followed his childhood interest. His family visited Spain when he was a teenager. He was enamored with Spanish culture and history um, and decided that that was going to be his, his body of knowledge. So he approaches Anna in 1921. He has founded the Hispanic Society in New York, uh, a cultural institution to um, collect and be able to um, help people understand the Hispanic culture and their heritage. And he was looking for an artist to design a medallion, a medal, an award medal, and he approaches Anna. Um, they had a great conversation. Anna found him fascinating because of his interest in art. Collis and um, uh, Arabella, his wife, uh, were great art collectors. But one of the things that Archer didn't like was collecting art in the house for the collection, just to have it laying around and not appreciating it. So he believed that art should be more public. 
And he wasn't left much money in his dad's will. The money went between his mother, his nephew and his mother. But when uh, Arabella died, um, Collis got about 500 million plus, depending on what numbers you look at. Um, so he's left with a large amount of money and he didn't believe in having a large amount of money either. So he started founding stuff. The Hispanic Society was one. So um, he and Anna meet. Anna writes him a letter. It was so nice to meet you. It's so great to be around somebody who has the same love of art as I do. And she scared the heck out of the poor man. Um, the reason being is in 1918, um, poor Archer um, found out his wife was uh, having an affair. They had a very acrimonious divorce. It hit all the society columns, all the papers. And Archer went into a deep depression and was only kind of coming out of it in 1921. He was eating himself to death, basically gained a lot of weight and um, just went to ground. It, nobody saw much of him. So it took him a bit to come back out and he and Anna had started a relationship and he proposed to her and she turned him down. <laughs> um, and he proposed again and she turned him down. And they had a very serious conversation after that. And she explained to him that she didn't want to give up her career. She was proud to do it. It fulfilled a need in her, in her and that um, the expectation that she would give up her career to be a housewife just was not something she could do. And Archer said, fine, that's not a problem. He was very, very proud of Anna and her work. He went out of his way to make it as easy as possible for her to study and to work. Uh, up to this point, she had been going, closing her New York study, studio every winter, going back to the family home, a summer home in Anasquam on the Anasquam River and working there. Um, Collis made sure that she had studio space paid for. She didn't really have to work unless she wanted to, which gave her a unique um, position in, in the arts world. From now on, she could take commissions she wanted to, and she could uh, turn them down. Um, she could do what she, just play, basically. But she did it a little differently. She and Archer go off on their honeymoon, they travel through Europe, and Archer introduced her to the Hispanic culture, and his loves. They travel through Africa, they travel through France, they go to England, they go to, oh, I don't know, Italy, all sorts of places. They did a whirlwind tour. And when they come back to the United States, Anna has developed a love for the Hispanic culture, not quite as much as, as Archer, but pretty close. And on March, they got married March 10th, 1923 in Anna's studio at the time that she shared with another artist. The um, the date was very significant because it was both of their birthdays. Anna was 47 at the time and um, Archer was 54. And the friends and acquaintances said, there's no way this is gonna work. You've got an artist who shows her emotions through art and you've got someone who is introverted and shows his emotions through poetry and scholarly, um, scholarly works and nobody thought they would last and they were very surprised. It was a perfect match. Um, they understood each other well, and they matched. They um, they matched each other very well. It was a good. It was a good marriage. And the 1920s, uh, aluminum was becoming big in some architecture. Um, obviously, aluminum's not new, but Anna decided to change some of the way she sculpted. She was the first artist, the first significant artist in the United States to use aluminum. Um, and you will see some of the statues here that are also aluminum uh, around us. Aluminum had some benefits. After she and Archer married, Archer wanted to help um, introduce her art to the world. And so they developed some traveling exhibits, um, art collections, parts of her collection that would go all around the United States, sometimes overseas, so people could enjoy it. The problem with bronze is it's very dark. It doesn't show light very well. It's heavy. Um, it's hard to move around. And Anna found that aluminum was, um, it showed light better, it showed details better, it was easier to pack, it was easier to move, and it was, it was about the same cost actually as bronze to, to make, but they just seemed to do better and people seemed to like them a bit more than bronze. And you can see the two swans at the upper left, um, Boy meets Jack Rabbit, or Baby meets Jack Rabbit at the upper right, the alligator at the bottom left, and the yawning tiger 
at the bottom right um, pieces in our collection. I have to push our collection. Um, also, this is an exhibit of Anna Hyatt's work here that uh, occurred somewhere around 1939. I don't have an exact date, but you can see the padding and the, the crates that the pieces came in. And obviously, they're sitting upright like that, so they don't have much weight to them. Um, she did give our museum the choice of um, picking whatever sculptures we wanted out of the collection. I don't necessarily agree with the ones that they gave up, but not my call. I wasn't around in 1939. So we've got this. Recognize Betty Davis? A lot of people do. Now there's a question about Diana of the Hunt. Um, Anna wanted something a little different than an animal sculpture. She wanted to test herself a bit. She decided to portray Diana. A lot of people had portrayed, artists had portrayed Diana. Um, usually, oops, hello, sorry. Usually she was firing her, her bow out. Um, Anna decided to make it, she's firing it into the sky. And so she uses a nude model. Now, in the night, about 1979, I believe, um, Betty Davis was giving a, um, an interview to Playboy magazine. And she said she remembered, and she wasn't exactly proud of it, that when she was around 18, she posed nude for a Diana statue. There's no guarantee that this is a particular statue. There's another statue that was called, I believe it's called Sun, that portrayed Anna, that portrayed um, Diana in sort of the same fashion. Um, that statue is on private property. Um, it actually belongs to the Moon Church, um, Sun Yon Moon's church, but um, they're not entirely sure. But you can see this image of uh, Betty Davis at 16 looks really close to Diana. Um, even the side, even the, the chin and the, the side. So um, there have been some scholars that say that there's no way it doesn't look close enough, but yeah, I'll leave it to you. Diana's statue, this Diana statue was so popular that um, somebody else was interested, the Moon Car Company. Um, they had a, a um, between, um, January of 1928 and, um, I'm sorry, June of 1925 and January of 1928, the Moon Car Company was producing a car called the Diana and they turned um, sort of a variation of the Diana statue into their uh, radiator cap. As far as I know, there's only one 1925 Diana straight eight sedan left. Um, it's really cool, you can see it online. Um, but Anna was also very generous with her art in terms of uh, sharing it. So a museum in, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna check. Uh, museum in Westport, um, in Wa I'm sorry, Washington County, Connecticut, asked if they could use the depiction of Diana as for their stationery and as their logo, and she agreed. Um, they've they still got it on their website, but they've, they've toned it down a little bit. They got a more modern. Um, a more modern logo now. Archer's influence on Anna was strong enough that she wanted, she was doing a lot of art for the Hispanic society. And one of the pieces was El Cid. Um, there was a, a writings by El Cid that Archer had translated into English, a English poem. And, um, he was a revolutionary Spanish hero, 11th century. So Anna took it as um, this would be a good statue for the Hispanic society, and so did Archer, and she started working on it. The poor gentleman on the right is a staffer at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He is wearing a loincloth, don't look too closely. Um, but to pose him, they put him on a barrel with a saddle and had him stand. Um, that was the, nude, the almost nude model that she used for El Cid. Um, El Cid actually, she, um, she did the sculpture as a three-dimensional where you could walk all the way around it, but when they wanted to install it at the Hispanic Society, they wanted to put it up against a wall. So when it was cast, they kind of flattened it a bit. It's still it's kind of 3D, but it's a little flatter than it should have been. 
she started the first sculpture, the first, yeah, first sketches for this, um, clay sketches in 1923. Um, I believe, I'm not quite sure when it was, when it was put up. You can see the armature for the leg for the statue here, the metal on the left, and on the right is the wood form that they used that they would put the clay over. Um, obviously, this is a, a big, um, a big time consuming thing. Um, obviously, you can also see why some women sculptors were expected not to be able to handle this and it was not expected that Anna could be doing it herself. She does have a little help here. 1927 um, was a, another bad year for Anna. She started out with um, what was a bad, seemed like a bad cold. She was having trouble breathing. She was having trouble coughing. Um, they, she was diagnosed with bronchitis. Uh, it turned out to be tuberculosis. So she was having a lot of trouble getting over it, but part of the problem is Anna was obstinate and didn't believe in resting. Um, she was continually trying to move and, and, and do things. And so in an effort to um, get her to heal, Archer arranges for her to go to a sanitarium in Switzerland. She was there about six months. Her health started improving. Um, she did sneak out of bed and walk around a lot. Um, when they caught her, they weren't happy. But she improved enough they could release her. She gets back to the United States um, not quite well. So they, they try a sanitarium in Carolina, South Carolina. Um, they try Arizona for the drier air. She's getting slightly better, but not quite. And at that point, they decide it's time to get out of New York. Um, I think that um, Hunter, um, Archer Huntington gave her probably an out. I don't think Anna would have left the house. She was sort of a frugal woman, even, um, even married with all that money. She'd always been frugal. She didn't really feel like spending money if she didn't have to. There was a slight exception. Um, Anna did have a tendency to go to the racetrack in New York to study the horses, and she would more often than not put a small wager on the one she felt like might win. She was sometimes right. Um, but Archer told her that as a, as a poet and as a writer, I'm having trouble in this atmosphere in the city. There's too much noise. There's too much going on. We have too many servants in the house. Um, because they had a mansion on Fifth Avenue, and so Anna agrees to move. They buy a um, a house, a home, uh, some land in upstate New York, and um, but the winters are too much for Anna, and so they travel down. They end up in South Carolina, um, uh, then and they end up buying four decrepit rice plantations together. Um, it was about the time for the depression. It was near the Depression time, 1930. Um, it was cheap. It was good land. And so they build a home on it, um, a rather ugly home, if you ask me, a block home that was uh, 13 rooms, which is kind of incredible. Um, that was very simplistic, but they could live there, and her health has started improving. Uh, there was a studio there. She had, and as Anna was wont to do, she had animals roaming free in her studio. She had monkeys, she had geese, she had uh, chickens, she had ducks, and even an alligator that would occasionally handle a slide through. Um, and they got the idea, or Archer got the idea, because Archer was sort of the push behind Anna's art. He was the one that was pushing, um, getting her, the recognition out and sending um, the exhibits out. and. He convinced her to let's let's turn this into a sculpture garden. Let's put your sculptures in this garden and let people come to see them. And so they did. But the Depression era breaks out, and artists are having a tough time. Even though the government is subsidizing some artwork, Anna and Archer make the decision to open the gardens to any sculptor. And she gets with um, this is the um, sculpture she did that shows her and and Archer, this is at the entrance of what would become Brook Green Gardens. Anna had met this gentleman, this is Robert Bailey, a, a stone cutter, when she was in a Borglum's uh, studio. And what he would do is take uh, the, small, the small pieces and cut them out of stone. Our 
Jaguars are limestone, but Anna found as her commissions increased, she didn't have time to do stone cutting. So what she would do is send her clay and wax pieces to um, Bailey's studio in New Jersey, and he and his crew would enlarge them. You can't see it too well, but there is there is a, um, I can't even this, there it is. There's a, a sort of a tripod on the top of this bronze Jaguar, and he is gonna take measurements, and then he is enlarging that in the stone. They asked Bailey to become the first curator of Burt Green Gardens, and many of the, the uh, limestone pieces there, he enlarged uh, from other artists' work. Um, I believe Brook Green's Gardens now has about 1,200 pieces, uh, still collecting. <laughs> um, Brook Green's Gardens, the, they summered in Brook Green's, they went back and they bought a place in Connecticut, uh, which is gonna be sort of their last home, uh, the last move for them. They called it Stannerig, uh, I think it means strength. And Anna decided she loves dogs. She is going to bring Irish wolfhounds to the United States to breed them. She and um, Archer get 10 pair. And this Stanner Rig line of Irish wolfhounds is started. And there are still Stanner Rig uh, um, dogs in the um, American Kennel Club. And they're still, you still see them winning. Um, so she, she did very well with that. In order to bring the dogs with them to Brook Green for the summer, Archer bought an old Greyhound bus, stripped it out, had it refitted um, with um, a bed and so on, and so they could travel to Brook Green with the dogs uh, fairly safely. Anna did not like flying, um, so she wouldn't. And during the war years, both World War I and World War II, Anna retreated back to both the family farm and to Stanerig, where she ran uh, Red Cross, um, the Red Cross out of the property. She uh, opened a cannery in her studio and um, with the neighbors they farmed and they canned and they did everything you were supposed to properly do as housewives during the war. Um, she also milked cows. Brook Green Gardens opens in 1932 and things are going pretty good. Um, Anna's health pretty much gets better about 1937. So she's got about 10 years of very little work. She's so exhausted, but she does manage to do a few larger pieces um, or at least start the initial sketches for them. And then as her health begins to improve, Archer starts declining. Archer was six foot five, a very large man. He had carried some weight on him earlier in life and he began to develop massive arthritis in his legs and his hips. He became more and more recluse and eventually wheelchair bound. Um, unfortunately, Archer is going to pass away in 1955 in his sleep at Stanerig. Um, Anna said of her husband, my greatest fortune comes in having a husband whose encouragement and guidance is in the absolute sympathy and gives me the freedom to work that is the lot of very few artists. It was truly a love match. Um, Anna did continue on. Um, she was working on a statue um, after Archer's death of Marti, um, Jose Marti, who was a Cuban patriot. And she finished the sculpture. It was actually paid for by Cuban Americans in the United States, but the um, New York, um, New York government did not want to put it up because they were afraid it would bring revolutionaries in to cause trouble. And so the statue stayed pretty much in a warehouse for about 10 years until they decided it was appropriate. Um, you can see the massive size of the legs um, as she's working on it. And keep in mind, Anna's in her 80s at this point. She's um, late 70s, early 80s. She also, um, the last statue that she seemed to have done that we know of, large statue, is um, of Israel Putnam, who has escaped uh, at Horse's Neck during the Revolutionary War, and he literally rode a horse down steps. Um, obviously, as an older woman, this took quite a bit, um, but it is, um, it's actually at Bunker Hill, and she was 90 when she completed it. This is Archer's dedication to Anna. Anna um, lives to 98, she dies in 1973. And Archer's poem, and this is at Brook Green on a, on a plate, 
To those whose joyous smile across the haze of weariness would flood with light these days and fold the valley of our journeying, even in the silvery dawn of spring. To you, my heart, as much a sunlight sea welcomes your soul, ship of my destiny. With you in splendor past all dreams desire, I found a world lighted by love's true fire. Here at the museum, we, um, we have Taming the Wild, a statue d um, designed by Anna to celebrate Collis. Um, I'm getting close to time, aren't I? <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting the walk. <laughs> um, surrounded by four figures, um, industry, art, science, and learning. One of the things that you may have kind of picked up on was not only did Anna make multiples, she also recycled well. Um, at the El Cid, statue that's at the hispanic society has the same figures they're just holding swords she adapted them for our taming the wild statue and if you're ever curious how those things come in this is the top of that statue the youth and the horse coming in sideways they ran a railroad track a temporary railroad track into the museum grounds so they could roll her in and you can see how it's padded Um, this is the base, which I believe weighs like 19 tons. Um, the figures weigh about 14 tons each. And this is the, um, the top of the statue in Bailey's uh, stone, uh, stone Foundry in uh, New Jersey. If you look kind of close at the picture on the left, you're going to see what looks like warts on the figure. Those are actually the marks they use to enlarge the figure. Um, you can kind of see them on this. And we can't forget our lions, our lions bridge. Um, the lions were originally designed for um, the Bronx Zoo. There are a set at uh, Brook Green Gardens and about four other places around the United States. Um, so Anna did do her, her same designs, which show up in different places. Um, of uh, Joan of Arc, there are five, one in Quebec, one in California. Uh, one in France at her birthplace, one at Brook Green, uh, one in Gloucester, Massachusetts, where Anna lived. Anna was very unlike other artists. She never did a self-portrait of herself, but she did do her hands. Um, she cast her hands and those of Collis and those of Archer, um, but she was very honest. She li I live in fear that I may someday be satisfied with what I do then I will know I am no longer an artist. Her need to, to expand her knowledge and to expand her talent and to, to push herself knew no bounds. Um, but there are other types of work that, that exist. Um, this is a kind of a haunting bust of her mother. Uh, Bailey carved this uh, from, her, um, from her cast. Um, the bust of Collis, which is staring at most of you from over there, and a... Um, a sculpture of her mother sitting in the easy chair reading. And to give you an idea of some of the other work that she did, this is, I love this, this is a fish hawk in, in um, uh, aluminum, of course. This one is at Syracuse University in their collection. Um, the monkey on a stick, which is in the Smithsonian's collection, this is one of the pieces that we had on display in 1939 in the exhibit. Um, done by um, probably the monkey at Brook Green. These are um, Triton riding a hippocampus. Um, these are fountain figures. They're actually about 55 inches tall. Uh, they were done in 1920. And uh, a bull and cape from the Smithsonian collection, another aluminum. This is Fawn's playing. The Gibbs Museum owns this one. It's done in 1934. And she did multiples of this one, too. Um, Tigers on a Rock, another, um, another uh, aluminum. And this, I believe, was in it, is also in the exhibit. One of my favorites, coat, uh, Colt Biting is Rump. <laughs> um, and Close by in Newport News Point, there is a statue of Collis with um, ship plans, and he's pointing off towards the water. This is at Christopher Newport 
Park and it's at the corner of West Avenue and 27th Street. It's also the place you can go to see the lookout for the, mon the monitor in the Merrimack, where, or the monitor in Virginia, where they fought. And uh, uh, two elephants. Despite the fact that they tried to get her, she still liked them. Um, and a pair of greyhounds, one of the earliest pieces she did uh, showing the, some of the family dogs. And Colts playing. Thank you for for listening. Um, I hope I hope you have some of the um, some of the joy of Anna's work and some of the love of her work. And please, if you get the chance, read up on her and look at more information, because there's no way to get her career in anything. I have about 60 pages of notes, and there's no way to to really pass on who she was as a person and an artist. But we do thank her and Archer for our museum.